I'm a sex educator and I've gone into schools a few times to teach sex ed, but most of the work that I do is creating content online. And most of the people who engage with my work are now adults, although some of you may have been teenagers when you started watching my videos. I myself was a teenager when I started making videos. But I'm still a huge advocate for comprehensive relationships and sex education, or RSE, in schools. So in 2017, MPs voted to make RSE compulsory in all schools in England. Guidance for what this RSE should look like was published in 2019, and it was going to be mandatory from 2020, although there's been a slow rollout due to the pandemic. And this was a huge win. Mandatory, comprehensive RSE in schools is something that many groups have been campaigning for for decades. Of course, schools were giving RSE before 2020. I had sex ed in school and I went to school in the noughties, but it wasn't mandatory for all schools, so the content and quality very much varied on a school by school basis. So I'm a parent now, and I know that many of my viewers are also parents and teachers, or just have young people in their lives. And so I wanted to talk about sex education. Let's chat about sex ed history, the backlash to current RSE curriculum, and bust some myths about RSE. And thank you so much to the team at Brooke for helping me with the research for this video. Brooke are the UK's leading sexual health charity, and I've been an ambassador of them for many years. So, sex Sex education history. The 1970s brought with it one of the first major controversies in sex education in schools. A film called Growing Up, released in 1971, made by British sexologist Dr. Martin Cole, was shown in schools. And it was considered explicit then, and probably would still be considered explicit by today's standards too, showing scenes of masturbation and pictures of intercourse. And it was also rooted in just a super sexist gender binary. It is obvious that boys are different from girls and men different from women. Indeed, we know most of the reasons for these differences. For example, women are made to have babies and to care for them, so they have broad hips to allow the baby to be born easily. They also have breasts which will produce milk for the newborn child, and they will have a maternal instinct which makes them want to care for their children. Men are different. They are made to follow a more energetic existence, to leave the home and to go to work. Therefore, they have a more muscular build. They are physically stronger. And instead of giving birth and caring for babies, they are often better at giving birth to new ideas. They are, in fact, usually more inventive and creative. Thanks, I hate it. Then it's not like things got any better because the 1980s brought with it Margaret Thatcher and Section 28. Section 28 was legislation that prohibited local authorities, so schools and libraries came under this, from promoting homosexuality. If you want to know more about Section 28 and its impact, I would highly recommend Rowan Ellis's video on the history of homophobia in schools. Books with any mention of LGBTQ plus people were removed moved from schools and libraries, and teachers were afraid of even mentioning the existence of gay people for fear of breaking the law. During the years of Section 28, there was the 1993 Education Act. This said that sex ed could be provided in schools in a way that would encourage young people to have regard to moral considerations and the value of family life. Whose morals? Whose family values? And in 2000, the government shared sex and relationships education guidance. It wasn't mandatory to teach, but schools had to have a policy setting out what it was they taught. There was absolutely no mention of LGBTQ plus people in this guidance, but Section 28 was very much still in place. And it was very much about the core values of marriage and stable relationships. Section 28 stayed in place until 2003. For context, I started secondary school in 2003. But even beyond 2003, many teachers were trained under Section 28, so wouldn't have had any training in how to talk about LGBTQ plus issues, and the fear and stigma doesn't disappear overnight. And that brings us to the 2017 guidance. Finally, mandatory comprehensive RSE. It was introduced as RSE 
H-E, relationships, sex, and health education. And actually prior to 2017, pretty much this whole industry and this whole field referred to it as SRE, sex and relationships education, but then it was changed to RSE with emphasis on relationships over sex, which was interesting. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> also interesting and very frustrating, one of the key drivers for RSE was concerns around sexual harassment, bullying, and sexual violence in schools. There has since been an Ofsted report, Everyone's Invited, which said that every school should assume this is an issue and act accordingly. The Department for Education promised special guidance on how to address this issue in RSE, but there has been nothing yet. Sexual harassment, bullying, and sexual violence are still hugely important and pressing issues for young people and schools, and the government has still issued no guidance on how to address it. But let's now look at the current state of RSE. So it's mandatory, the guidance exists, but it's limited. For one, there is no mention of pleasure anywhere in the guidance. I'm sorry, but what? Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Are we living in a rotophobic society or what? And parents in England are still able to withdraw their young people from some aspects of RSE, which no. And just generally, if we're looking at the state of schools, there's been a pandemic. There's a lack of curriculum time. Teachers are overworked and underpaid. There is a lack of funding and a lack of knowledge and expertise. By the end of last year, 2022, only £3.5 million of the government's estimated cost of £29 million was spent on implementing RSE in schools, despite teachers asking for more training and resources, especially around sexual harassment, bullying, and sexual violence. Most schools and teachers are just doing their damn best with the limited resources that they have. And that brings us to sex education education being under attack again. There have been a lot of conversations in the news media about RSE in 2023. There's a lot of myths and misinformation out there and a lot of fear mongering around taking away children's innocence. People are opposed to the LGBTQ plus inclusivity of RSE and this is happening against a whole backdrop of transphobia with outright attacks on the bodily autonomy and rights of trans people and especially trans youth youth. Campaigning by Tory MP Miriam Cates has led to RSE in schools now being under review, and it hasn't even been in existence for more than three years. Some of these concerns are around extreme sexualized and inaccurate materials, explicit resources from activist organizations, God forbid, and the big question of what is appropriate. God, I hate that word. So what's actually happening here? It is not reflective of RSE that is actually being delivered in schools. Quotes are being taken out of context from RSE aimed at adults, not at school children. Teachers are not being provided with adequate training for dealing with these sensitive topics and answering young people's questions. It is just plain old fashioned misinformation and fear mongering. And no one is listening to young people. They are all saying they want more RSE, not less. Also, just a quick rant about the term appropriate. This tends to be more about what politicians think is politically palatable rather than what young people and experts are saying that they actually want and need. We don't want to be putting age limitations on certain topics because it prevents schools from being able to respond to specific safeguarding concerns or current issues in a school. Young people's social and emotional development can vary and age limits would exclude the needs of children with special educational needs. And I'll leave a link in the description to where you can find out more about why Brooke refers to age and stage appropriate RSE. Okay, it is time to bust some myths. RSE ruins children's innocence. There is a massive difference between innocence and ignorance. One of the things a good RSE curriculum is, is protective. Knowing which body parts are private, understanding appropriate and inappropriate behavior, learning about bodily autonomy. Children who are ignorant of these things are more vulnerable and can be more easily targeted by abusers. RSE provides too much information too soon. Actually, most of the feedback from young people about the RSE that they received was that it was too little 
too late. For many, puberty and periods can start towards the end of primary school, and it's best to learn about things like sex, healthy relationships, and porn before you encounter it in the real world. And like I said, the term age appropriate gets thrown around a lot here, but it can be really misleading. It's really hard to draw lines about what should be taught at what age. In the end, it becomes really arbitrary. Instead, we should be taking into account, yes, age, but also development level, behavior, what is relevant to the young people's lives, and specifically to the young people sat currently in front of you in that specific lesson. RSE is making kids LGBTQ+. RSE that only mentions cis heterosexual people doesn't make queer and trans kids any less queer and trans. It just makes them more likely to be bullied, stigmatized, discriminated against, and to feel isolated, contributing to mental health issues. LGBTQ plus inclusive education is reflective of reality, actually protects young people, and makes them less sexist, homophobic, biphobic, and transphobic. It's not gonna make anyone gay or trans if a school lesson could do that, we would all be cis and straight, which we're not. External organizations are controlling RSE. Ooh, these pesky activist organizations. For one, if teachers were properly trained and felt confident in delivering RSE, schools would be less reliant on external organizations. But the thing is, students actually quite like having somebody different teaching them RSE. It's a different teaching style, new perspectives, and they often prefer these outside experts because they find it less embarrassing and feel more able to ask questions. And also, these external organizations are the experts. And schools have the ability to check these different organizations' resources and safeguarding policies. Some that I would recommend are, of course, Brooke. You can check out local authorities' resources. There's the School of Sex Ed, Split Banana, Sexpression, and ASET. RSE is hidden from parents. It's in the guidance that schools share their RSE policy and curriculum with parents, which by the way, doesn't happen for any other subject. But also we need to recognize that no two RSE lessons are the same. Young people will have different questions and different things come up, but broadly and generally parents are being informed about what their kids are being taught. Also Brooke and the Sex Education Forum found that most parents are actually really supportive of RSE and really appreciate appreciate the involvement because it means that they can then go and continue those sex ed conversations at home. Parents are the most reliable source of RSE for their kids. This is the age-old question, who is responsible for sex ed? Parents? Schools? Pornography? One in four young people report receiving no RSE at all from their parents. And only 17% of young people surveyed had regular conversations about RSE with their parents or carers. And in a survey of university students, the majority did not feel that their parents were a useful source of information on RSE. And this was even more marked for young people from minority communities or those who were LGBTQ+. And the unfortunate reality is that much abuse takes place in the family home, and so we can't assume that the home is a safe place for discussions about sex and relationships. And most parents will have received inadequate sex education from school themselves. What parents can be really good at is sharing values with their children. And school and home working together to provide RSE is often the best outcome for young people. And I just want to talk about what's happening for trans youth because they are a particularly vulnerable group at the moment with transphobia and difficulty accessing gender affirming healthcare. So this is separate from the RSE curriculum but obviously very connected. There has been a proposed law that schools can't use a child's preferred name or pronouns in school without that child's parents or carers consent. Now schools can be a safe place for many trans and gender non-conforming young people to start using new names or new pronouns at school without having to come out to their parents at home. This law simply would put young people in danger. And it really is just another example of this double standard in how we treat cis people and trans people. We already know it has very much already been established that young people need privacy, bodily autonomy, and self-determination without their parents' consent. Children under 16 can go to the doctors. Children under 
under 16 can get the pill or an abortion without their parents knowing. We do this for their safety, privacy, and autonomy. So why aren't those same principles being applied here to young trans people? Riddle me that. Brooke have recently added a whole parents and carers section to their website, which has loads of information about RSE, what is happening at school, and what you can do at home. Also, please, as the government is currently reviewing and updating the RSE guidance, we need as many people as possible to make it clear to MPs the kind of RSE we support. There is a pledge you can sign, link below. Anyone can sign it, young person, adult, parent, teacher, carer, whoever. And there's an easy template letter that you can use to send to your MP. And this is the kind of RSE that the pledge says that you support. Protective, keeping children and young people safe in today's digital era. Developmentally appropriate and responsive to the questions children ask and to current and emerging issues. Empowering, celebrating healthy relationships, not just addressing risk and harm. Inclusive, relevant to all students and reflective of the whole community. Evidence-based, informed by research and by children and young people's experiences. Effective, focusing on life skills and open discussion as well as factual knowledge. Professional, taught by trained teachers and supported by specialists. Engage with parents and carers to ensure RSC meets the needs of families. Thank you so much for watching this video and thank you so much to Brooke for helping with this and all of the work that they do. Links to everything in the description. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you would like to share, please let me know in the comments a horrific, funny, silly, or really amazing thing that happened in sex ed that you received in school. And thank you so much to my patrons for supporting the work that I do. You can check out our lovely community called The Common Room, where there is lots of bonus content and behind the scenes access if you wish. I hope that you're doing well and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!